On August 29, 1984, Rosemarie Fritzl reported her daughter, Elizabeth, missing to her local authorities in Amstetten, Austria. The 18-year-old had disappeared the previous day, after helping her father, Joseph, with a construction project. She had not been seen since. While the police searched for Elizabeth Fritzl over the coming weeks, it became apparent that the young girl had simply run off. The youth had disappeared in January of 1983 while training to become a waitress, before eventually being found in Vienna, living with a work friend. The police's suspicions were all but confirmed a month later, when Joseph delivered a handwritten note from Elizabeth, claiming that she was living with a friend in nearby Braunau Am Inn. In the letter, she warned her parents to leave her alone, or else she would quit Austria altogether. This letter, alongside Elizabeth's prior behavior, confirmed an Austrian stereotype of bratty runaways at the time. The investigation into Emily's disappearance ended, with Joseph telling the police that he believed his daughter had joined a cult. Despite Joseph's belief, the police never followed up. To the police, Elizabeth was merely an ungrateful child who had moved to a nearby town despite her parents. Rosemary and Joseph would be kept in silence about Elizabeth's whereabouts. For years, their supposedly safe daughter gave no correspondence. The public sympathized with the Fritzels, who were upstanding members in their community, and who had been abandoned by their awful, ungrateful child. One day, nearly a decade later, Rosemary was shocked when Joseph arrived at their home with a cardboard box, inside of which was Lisa. According to an accompanying note, Elizabeth had birthed this child and breastfed her for six and a half months, but that the child was now bottle-fed and capable of eating. She was leaving the child in her parents' care. Elizabeth's writing was cheery, and she again warned her parents not to search for her. While the police were notified about the occurrence, they found little reason to reopen the missing persons case. The letter was written in Elizabeth's handwriting and was consistent with the correspondence she had sent in 1984. Social workers were also content with the Fritzl's care of their grandchild. According to a report, the Fritzl parents quickly got over their shock and were committed to providing a loving home for their grandchild. On December 26, 1994, Rosemary and Joseph were met with another surprise, nine-month-old Monica. Unlike Lisa before her, Monica was not found in a cardboard box. Instead, Monica had been placed in Lisa's then-empty stroller in the Fritzl home's vestibule. Shortly after Monica's discovery, the phone rang. Rosemary answered, only hearing the words, I just left her at your door. The caller immediately terminated the call after uttering the phrase, and Rosemary was certain it was the voice of her daughter. As Rosemary reflected on the fact that her long-missing daughter had delivered to her another child and had just spoken with her mother on the phone, the older woman realized another curious detail. The Fritzels had recently acquired an unlisted number. How could Elizabeth have known this number? Who had given it to her? Two years later, in 1996, yet another child turned up at the Fritzel home, this time a boy named Alexander. The Fritzels were now raising three grandchildren, and the children's mother was still nowhere to be found. Joseph and Rosemary were incredibly caring guardians. Joseph was particularly doting to the children, encouraging them in any way he could, reading them books and playing cassettes borrowed from the local library. The children were involved in gymnastics and took music lessons, Lisa a flautist, and Monica and Alexander, trumpeteers. The children's music tutor was amazed at the resiliency of Rosemary Fritzel, who drove her grandchildren to their lessons on a daily basis. The teacher recalled only one instance where the good woman had shown vulnerability despite her unenviable position. It was when she recalled Elizabeth, who had run off and joined a cult. Her voice broke and tears fell from her eyes. She missed her daughter very much. The years went on. Lisa, Monica, and Alexander continued to grow, and the Fritzl parents continued to survive. While the pair were older, they were not quite of retirement age, and Joseph continued to work to support his family. Joseph worked on plans for machinery which he sold to manufacturing firms. He worked out of his basement and was deeply committed to his profession, often working late hours. The man descended to the basement at nine every morning, and was so deeply focused that he refused visitors. He wouldn't even allow Rosemary to bring him coffee. On April 19, 2008, a hospital in Amstead admitted a 19-year-old woman who was suffering from a puzzling condition. Her symptoms seemed to indicate extreme neglect. She was unresponsive and in critical condition. Hospital staff called the police, who questioned the man who accompanied the woman, Joseph Fritzel. Fritzel explained that he had found the woman after hearing disconcerting sounds outside his home. When he went to investigate, 
he found her leaning against a wall, unable to speak and explain her condition. The girl had a note, however, that revealed who she was. Kirsten Fritzel, yet another of Elizabeth's children. The note claimed that Kirsten desperately needed medical attention, so Joseph called an ambulance and accompanied the young woman to the hospital. Doctors were puzzled. Kirsten's symptoms were emblematic of epilepsy, but without more information, they did not know how to properly treat the young woman. Doctors needed to hear from Elizabeth, who seemed the only hope of providing the necessary knowledge to save Kirsten. Police immediately reopened the long-closed case of Elizabeth Fritzl's disappearance. They began by speaking with Joseph, who reiterated that his daughter had joined a sect and that they had had limited contact with Elizabeth since she left 24 years ago. However, Fritzl had recently received a letter from his daughter, dated January of 2008, seven months prior. In the letter, Elizabeth mentioned that yet another of her children, a son named Felix, had been ill, suffering from seizures and even a brief paralysis, though he recovered. The letter also indicated that Kirsten was also suffering from health problems. The letter was postmarked in Kamaten on der Krems, roughly 70 miles from Amstetten. It also noted that Elizabeth and her two children who remained in her care, Stefan and Felix, would shortly return to the Fritzl's hometown. Police investigated the lead in Kamaten and found that the doctors there were unfamiliar with Kirsten. They also found no relevant evidence of cult activity in Kamaten. Realizing the holes in Joseph's story and knowing the immediate danger at hand, the police contacted Manfred Wolfhart, an officer specializing in cults. In the 24 years since Elizabeth's disappearance, believed to have been the work of a religious cult, the police had not contacted Wolfhart. Now, however, investigators believed he could find the woman and save Kirsten's life. Wolfhart was presented with the letter and the note Joseph had provided. The investigator was immediately suspicious. The letter seemed too perfect, too smooth. They reflected the writing of someone providing a dictated legal note, as opposed to a letter from a daughter to her parents. As Wolfhart continued to examine the case, he found no evidence of cult activity. The police began to believe that Joseph Fritzl was lying to them. On April 26th, the hospital once again contacted authorities to report that two suspicious individuals had arrived to visit Kirsten. Police went to the hospital immediately and found Joseph with a mysterious woman. The woman was pale and listless. She appeared horribly malnourished. Police separated the visitors and began to question them separately. The woman identified herself as 42-year-old Elizabeth Fritzl, seen for the first time in 24 years. The investigators were astonished. They prodded Elizabeth for information, but she remained mum. When the detectives told her that she could tell them anything, and that she would not have to go back to her father if she did not want to, Elizabeth began to open up. Over the course of the next two hours, investigators would hear the horrid story that would define their careers. Elizabeth Fritzl was only 11 years old in 1977 when her father began to abuse her. One of seven children, the young girl's response to trauma was predictable, fear, self-hatred, and rebellion. In her teenage years, she had begun to party, going to bars and staying with friends, anything to keep her from Joseph. In 1983, just 19 months before her disappearance, she had been found by police after living with a friend. She completed a waitressing course and had just accepted a position in nearby Linz when, on August 28th, her father asked her to help him install a door in their basement. When she held the door to the frame so her father could drill it into place, Joseph instead covered her mouth with an ether-soaked rag. The drug knocked Elizabeth out cold, and her body was set in the basement. Elizabeth awoke in the cold, dark cellar sometime later. She was confused. Where was she? Why was she there? When her father returned, his abuses continued. He handcuffed her to a pole in the basement and, after fulfilling his sick desires, left her in the position for two days. Soon, Joseph would return with a leash, which would allow Elizabeth brief mobility. He would attach the leash to the pole and allow his daughter to move around and use the restroom. The leash remained on at all times, and the father, now in complete control of his daughter, used her lacking mobility to his demented advantage. Elizabeth cannot recall how long she was leashed, perhaps six months, perhaps nine. She also cannot recall how many times her father was upon her in this state. Joseph visited his prisoner at least thrice weekly. He delivered her food and a cassette player for entertainment. He warned her that if she should try to escape or attack him, 
he would gas the basement and kill her. Every time he left, he messed with a device near the door, perhaps an alarm of some kind, and perhaps simply a decoy meant to intimidate Elizabeth. The cell Elizabeth lived in was a single room, about 380 square feet in size. Inside were a wash basin, a toilet, a hot plate, a refrigerator, and a bed. Eventually, the leash was removed from Elizabeth, and she was able to move freely within her small enclosure. Of course, no natural light entered the space, and while electricity was available to Elizabeth, Joseph could shut it off at any time. In 1986, after nearly two years of imprisonment, Elizabeth had gotten pregnant by her psychopathic father. The pregnancy was short-lived, however, as the woman suffered a miscarriage after ten weeks. Two years later, however, Elizabeth was pregnant once again. This time, she gave birth to Kirsten in the lonely, silent cell. Joseph would not let Elizabeth leave her prison, even when Kirsten was born or when Elizabeth was ill. The pattern continued when Elizabeth gave birth to a second child, Stefan. Throughout her imprisonment, Joseph forced his daughter to write notes and recorded her voice saying certain phrases to keep the lie of her cult involvement strong. He had her write the note found alongside Lisa in 1993, when she was taken outside the cellar by Joseph to be cared for by the Fritzl parents. The exact reason why Lisa, and later Monica and Alexander, were taken out of the cell to live with Joseph and Rosemarie is unclear. Perhaps Elizabeth successfully convinced her father to remove the children and spare them a life of isolation and fear. Perhaps Joseph, in some mild shine of humanity, felt he owed it to the children. Or perhaps the adults simply felt the enclosed space was too small for so many people. In 1993, the basement was expanded. Joseph, having been convinced by his daughter that the space was simply too small, forced Elizabeth and the children to use their hands to dig out soil and expand the living space. The space grew to roughly 590 square feet. Monica was born in 1994, and she was followed by twins in 1996. Tragically, one of the two boys died less than three days later. Joseph incinerated the infant's body in the furnace. The surviving son, Alexander, was taken to live with Joseph and Rosemarie 15 months later. In late 2002, a final child, Felix, was born to Elizabeth. He remained in the cellar with his mother and less fortunate siblings. During the 24 years of Elizabeth's enclosure, her father would renovate the basement. The final iteration held a small corridor, a storage area, three cells, a kitchen, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. Each bedroom contained two books. The father would also provide a radio, a television, a VCR, and some books. Elizabeth taught her children to read and write. At times, an angry Joseph would punish his family by cutting their electricity for days at a time. Sometimes he would refuse to bring them food, leaving his family starving underground. Most heinous was Joseph's insistence on forcing Elizabeth to watch pornographic material with him. He would then make her reenact the scenes with him in front of their children. Joseph constantly told Elizabeth and the children that he would gas the basement should they try to escape, and that they would be electrocuted if they tried to fiddle with the electronic keypad that locked the door that exited the basement. On the night of April 18th, 2008, Kirsten Fritzl was dying. Elizabeth begged Joseph to take her to the hospital. Just as the decision to take some children above ground was unclear, so too was Joseph's eventual decision to take Kirsten to the hospital. Could it be that the monster had finally decided to show mercy on his kin? Or was he merely worried about how he would dispose of the dead body of a fully grown woman? Regardless, he and Elizabeth took Kirsten outside the cellar later that night. If Elizabeth looked into the night sky, she would have seen stars for the first time in nearly a quarter century. Joseph returned Elizabeth to the cellar and called for an ambulance. Elizabeth and the two children in her care remained behind, hoping that Kirsten would survive the ordeal. As Kirsten's condition puzzled doctors and Joseph scrambled to control the narrative with another of Elizabeth's dictated letters, news stations began to report on the mystery. From her dungeon, Elizabeth saw the world was closing in on her father. On April 26, 2008, one week after Kirsten was admitted to the hospital, Elizabeth, Stefan, and Felix were released from their hell. Joseph brought them to the house where Rosemary, completely oblivious to the horrors inflicted by her husband, was shocked to see her daughter and to meet her grandchildren for the first time. Joseph Fritzl, 73 years old at this point, was arrested for the 24-year imprisonment of his daughter 
and the endless list of further abuses he committed against her. He admitted to most of the story provided by Elizabeth, and gave police the codes necessary to access the tortuous cellar. The prison was located behind one of Joseph's basement workshops, and was opened by an electronic code. There were seven additional locked doors the police needed to navigate through, including a second door with an electronic lock, to reach the hellish scene. As the police investigated Fritzel, a chilling picture began to emerge. Instead of the sympathetic father who had lost his daughter to an alluring cult, the true nature of Joseph Fritzel was far more disturbing. Joseph was born in 1935 to a severe alcoholic and a mother with anger issues. His father abandoned the family when Joseph was four, and never returned. He was killed in action in World War II. Fritzl's mother was committed to a concentration camp in 1944, after attacking an officer in a fit of rage, leaving Fritzl with a foster family until his mother returned in 1945. His mother was strict, domineering, and violent, which painted Joseph's life, according to his lawyer. Joseph claims he was an alibi child, meaning that his mother only gave birth to him to prove she could have children. Joseph initially claimed his mother was the most wonderful woman in the world, but in later psychiatric sessions, he revealed that his mother often beat him and left him bleeding on the floor. He claimed to have never received a hug or a kiss from the woman. Joseph feared his mother throughout his childhood. He married Rosemary, then 17, in 1956, when Joseph was 21. The pair had seven children, with Elizabeth being the youngest. In 1959, Joseph bought a house, and his mother came to live with them. The tables had turned. Joseph's mother, now old and feeble, was terribly afraid of her angry, aggressive son. Eventually, Joseph locked her in his attic and used bricks to cover the single window there. He told his neighbors she had died. It is unclear how long the mother was in the attic until her eventual death in 1980, but police speculate it could have been as long as 20 years. In 1967, when Elizabeth was only one year old, Joseph broke into a home and assaulted a woman in Linz. According to the arrest, he had held a knife to the neck of the woman and threatened to murder her if she protested his vile act. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison for this act, though he would be released after 12. Fritzl would admit that his nefarious plan for Elizabeth occurred to him while he was in jail for this assault. He was suspected in additional assaults and was known as a serial flasher in the area. Despite this, he would not be charged with any other crime until the truth about Elizabeth came to light. Austrian law allowed his record to be expunged after 15 years. For this reason, when Elizabeth's children were left on the Fritzl doorstep 25 years later, no red flags were raised by social services regarding Joseph Fritzl. In 1978, Joseph began to build his dungeon. He obtained a legal permit to extend the basement, but built beyond the approved parameters. He began to convert the cellar into a prison in 1981, and extended it further in 1983, connecting his cellar to a pre-existing basement on the property that only he knew about. The Fritzls rented out rooms on their property, but tenants were extensively warned not to wander into the basement or to the garden area, underneath which was Elizabeth and her children. One tenant who lived near the basement complained to Fritzl of excessive noise, but Joseph assured the man that it was merely the sound of faulty gas pipes. Joseph told police that he had locked his daughter up to protect her from the outside world. He claimed his daughter was interested in drinking and characters of ill repute, and he wanted to save her. Psychiatrists disagree. They believe Joseph's depraved behavior is the result of an obsession with power and control. Some police believe Fritzl may be involved with three different murders committed in Austria. Fritzl had not made comments affirming his involvement in these crimes, and he has never been charged due to lacking evidence. Fritzl pled guilty to most of the charges levied against him, but he took exception to some of them. He claimed his relationship with Elizabeth was consensual. He admitted that he knew the imprisonment of his daughter was wrong, but blamed his behavior on his own upbringing and the rampant Nazism from his childhood. On March 29, 2009, Joseph Fritzl was sentenced to life imprisonment for his crimes against Elizabeth and her children, including negligent homicide of her infant son. He made no attempt to appeal. Kirsten, who had been placed in a medically induced coma, awoke on June 8, 2008. She gained consciousness in a world full of life and light, a world she had never known before. Elizabeth and her children were in relatively good physical health after emerging from the cell, but they had significant psychological problems. They required therapy to adjust to the light after so much time in darkness, 
and had difficulty adjusting to the open space around them. Psychiatrists noted that Kirsten and Stefan would have panic attacks from mundane occurrences, such as the dimming of lights and the closing of doors. It was revealed that Kirsten had torn her hair out at the roots in distress while living in the basement. Stefan had grown too tall to stand in the cellar, and had developed physical impairment due to constantly having to stoop. The upstairs children, as they were known to the media, resented their father and felt immense anger at the events that befell their mother and siblings. These children received counseling to deal with their intense emotions. The Fritzels were offered new identities and were set up in a villa by the psychiatrists. All six children in Rosemary lived alongside Elizabeth in this villa, though Elizabeth demanded her mother leave after a few months. The freed captive was angered at her mother's attitude in response to Joseph's crimes. Psychiatrists worked to assimilate the upstairs and downstairs children, as well as to help Elizabeth acclimate to her new life. While Elizabeth was estranged from Rosemary, she did allow the upstairs children to visit their grandmother on regular intervals. After the trial in 2009, the location of the Fritzel's private villa was leaked, and British paparazzi began to harass the family. This led to the family relocating to an unnamed town in northern Austria. The latest reporting on Elizabeth and her children comes from 2010, when it was reported that she and her children were doing remarkably well. The children had assimilated to society, had learned to accept their siblings, and now saw Elizabeth as their mother. Elizabeth enjoys a social life, and one of the bodyguards assigned during the trial of Joseph Fritzl has become a mentor to the children. Elizabeth and Rosemary have reportedly mended their relationship and visit each other often. The younger woman has forgiven her mother for falling for the dreadful father's lies. Joseph Fritzl's cellar was filled in 2013. His home was sold in 2016, with the buyers intending to destroy the estate and replace it with apartment buildings. Prison life for Joseph Fritzl has not been easy. He changed his name to Joseph Meyerhoff after being recognized and attacked in jail. The assault resulted in him losing teeth. Journalists who have interviewed Fritzl over the last 15 years have stated that the man shows no remorse for his actions. One journalist claims that Fritzl told him to look into the cellars of other men and see the families and daughters they're hiding. It has been reported that Joseph Fritzl is in failing health, and some speculate he suffers from dementia. Now 88 years old, Joseph Fritzl is eligible for parole this year, though it is unlikely he will ever be granted such a privilege. Elizabeth attended only the second day of her father's trial in order to get information for a book she was writing about her ordeal. Her eyes met his, despite Elizabeth wearing a disguise, causing Joseph to go pale. It was the last time Elizabeth, now free, saw her father, now permanently imprisoned.